In this episode of Wild Roots, we speak with naturalist and science writer Cy Montgomery about her animal friends and what they have taught her in her journey to learning all that she can about the creatures that make up the natural world. Her question was, what have you learned yourself for your life in working with all of these different animals? And I thought for about a second before I gave my answer, and the answer was how to be a good creature. Sai's work revealed to her that all she had ever felt she knew about animals was true. She realized they had complex emotions and even superpowers beyond human capabilities and offered so much more. We're finding out new superpowers for animals week by week. They are just amazing. Sai also shares with us on how we can better connect to the natural world and to the wondrous living beings with whom we share this world. So join us alongside size friends, Molly, a black terrier, Clarabelle, a pink toed tarantula, and a brilliant giant Pacific octopus named Octavia, as they teach us how to appreciate the natural world, how to love, forgive, and so much more. Cy Montgomery has been described as part Emily Dickinson and part Indiana Jones. In her global adventures to research her books, she has encountered silverback gorilla, orangutan, pink dolphins, electric eels, tigers, tree kangaroos, and more. Cy has written 28 books featuring these animals, which focus mainly on animal behavior and consciousness. She has realized the most significant thing animals have taught her, in which she shares with us in this episode. So tell us, how did you decide to write the book, How to Be a Good Creature? Well, years ago, I was on a program with my friend Vicki Croak. She's written a number of excellent books, the most recent of which is called Elephant Company. You may also know her book, The Lady and the Panda. She's written others as well. They're all splendid. But she had a program associated with uh, Boston Public Radio, which had a video component. And she and her, um, her partner came to the house to record an interview with me. And she asked me about a lot of the animals that I had, had met and worked with through the years. And the very last question that she asked me is the one that gave the title to this book. Her question was, what have you learned yourself for your life in working with with all of these different animals? And I thought for about a second before I gave my answer, and the answer was, how to be a good creature. Well, this was archived online, and one of the editors at Houghton Mifflin happened to see it, and she told my editor, Kate O'Sullivan, this has got to be Sai's next book. So that's how it came about. How very cool. I wrote cool. about the 13 animals who, who helped me with very specific issues that I think many of us face, you know, like, like how to find, how to know your destiny, and then how to find your destiny. And how do, how do you make a family that works in this world? And how do you get past anger? And how do you get past grief? And how do you fall in love with the world over and over again? And these are the animals that showed me how. 
From the very first chapter of this book, I saw myself in your story of your childhood. I too didn't relate to humans or people as well as I did and continue to do so to the natural world. And I too had many animal friends. I was always baffled when somebody said something like, I don't like cats or I don't like dogs or any creature for that matter, even if it was an insect or whatever that they didn't like. Yeah, I I too. just I just didn't understand it because to me it seemed odd that there were people who didn't like animals or didn't have pets and I saw this to be often correlated with like a disregard for the rest of the natural world and yeah. at least that's how I perceived it you know I was confused by people's dislike for animals because I guess I never saw anything inherently bad about non-human creatures <laughs> And the acts that, you know, may seem mean or cruel from an animal were like easily dismissible. And the acts were always understandable, always justifiable, but not so by acts of many humans. So I always felt more connected to the non-human living world. And if I just see a, a, an insect on the trail, I'm like, hi, instantly. I'm, I, I, yeah. I say hi to every creature I meet and my... That's who I am. And it's a genuine hello, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, another, it's another soul. Yeah. And they are going about their business with their important, precious lives the same way we are. Yeah. So it stunned me that people, that someone could be completely unmoved by nature's wondrous living things. And I always felt the way that Jane Goodall does is that apathy for the natural world is a very dangerous view. You tend to recognize that animals have superpowers that humans don't. And as naturalists, I think this is one of the most captivating things about animals. They possess these amazing qualities in the form of evolved adaptations. Can you talk a bit about some of the superpowers of the animals that you have met? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And animals, well, even the commonest of animals have amazing superpowers, like crickets who can sing with their legs. You know, and here with their knees. Sharks, for example, have ampullae of Lorenzini, these amazing organs with which they can detect the heartbeat of their prey, the electrical current of their heartbeat. Other animals, like electric eels, have electricity and can shock their prey and then suck it in through their mouth. And Almost every creature you can name, from the beautiful glowworms that everyone remembers from their childhood, to giant elephants that you may not have a chance to meet, elephants have a superpower that was only discovered in the 1980s. They can detect hearing below the, uh, they can detect um, sounds below the threshold of human hearing, called infrasound. And in this way, they can communicate with others across vast distances. And now we know, we've solved a mystery about why elephants in one remote location seem to be terribly upset when elephants in another place far away were being killed or culled. Mm -hmm. It's because they could hear the cries of those elephants miles away, transmitted via infrasound below the threshold of our hearing. We're finding out new superpowers for animals week by week. They are just amazing. I've always been captivated by animals. Just just the other day, I got so excited because I found a glowworm in my backyard, in my very own backyard, and it's so rare to find them in this region. And, and it's amazing. I yeah. Mean, this whole bioluminescent stuff. And they're even finding new creatures left and right, even as we're extinguishing many species. I know. We're still discovering new species with amazing new superpowers and finding superpowers in species that we didn't know had them yeah and it's all you know it's it's all about paying attention to the natural world and i feel like our species really was made to pay attention to the natural world eo wilson speaks of biophilia the natural connection to the rest of life on our planet and it makes sense because until very recently all humans were hunter-gatherers. And if you did not pay attention to the natural world, you very quickly starved or were eaten by something. (laughs) So, unfortunately, I think in today's world, we kind of stomp this out, a piece of our 
spare humanity. We, we wreck it in our children. We encourage them to pay attention to only one species, which is crazy. We would never tell our children to only listen to one kind of music or only eat one kind of food or only paint with one color. And yet, so many people encourage their kids to pay attention only to human beings. Mm -hmm. And that's just a way to impoverish a person, Absolutely. to cut them off from the rest of the world. Yeah, that extreme anthropocentric view was so bizarre to me growing up. Even despite all of the research and all of the knowledge that we've gained from learning from wildlife and still people prefer to care for and pay more attention to the soft and cuddly ones or the ones that we've defined as cute and domesticated animals over other wild animals or so-called creepy crawlies and you see parents that are teaching their kids to be scared of everything you know instilling these fears of spiders and all these other creepy crawlies all these other critters which, which i have always just loved every every oh, yeah. one of them and you know it, it's so easy to, the, to learn the, um, the chapters in my book is about clarabelle who right. was a pink toe tarantula who i met wild in french canada and she taught me the very important lesson that little lives matter as much as big ones and you know we're, we were talking about domestic versus wild animals and I kind of consider domestic animals like dogs and cats. They're kind of the gateway drug to loving all animals. Yeah, yeah. And it certainly was that way for me. Yeah. And I'm, one of the, my very first chapters, you know, in the book is about Molly. Right. Um, when I was a little girl, I did not want to be a little girl. <laughs> I wanted first to be a pony. And my father would call me pony. My mother was horrified. She went to the pediatrician <laughs> who said, oh, that, that won't last, don't worry. And she was right, because yeah. I soon realized that I was really a dog. And my existential problem was, everyone wanted to teach me to be a little girl, in which I had zero interest. <laughs> Nobody could teach me to be a dog, until we got Molly, yeah. as a puppy. And she's the one who showed me, with her exquisite senses, that the great beautiful green living world out there, much bigger than our backyard, mm -hmm. was really there because her senses were connecting with it. Mm -hmm. And I always dreamed of growing up and running away with Molly and living in the forest where I would get to know the wild animals. Mm -hmm. And although Molly, alas, did not live long enough for me to grow up because dogs do not live long enough, mm -hmm. I did grow up to do, to live that dream. And that is what I do for a living right now. I spend my life traveling around the world, meeting animals, learning their truths, and sharing them with my readers. And I am living the dream I had as a child, which I realized was possible, thanks to my dog, Molly. I am so happy for you for that, and that Molly showed you that destiny. And um, I was actually going to start to talk about um, Clarabelle because in the book you you talk about that first first time experience holding her and connecting with the tarantula and that experience is very similar to the experience of, of my holding a rattlesnake for the first time and oh, wow. I felt extreme extremely humbled and and I I just was moved with tears in my eyes I just had this wave of honor for the snake it just oh, it just was such a powerful lovely. experience that that I wish more people could have um and mostly in regard to handling animals I'm, I've never been really scared at all of handling animals but you know the power of a rattlesnake <laughs> so right. um mostly I'm concerned with hurting them <laughs> if I'm handling them you know I don't want to hurt a, a delicate creature or something so tell us, what does touching or handling an animal reveal about their good nature? When you touch an animal in a, in a respectful way, I mean, not every animal wants to be touched, of absolutely. course. Some of them are absolutely terrified. They think a predator is coming. Mm -hmm. um, people don't always want to be touched by other people, so we totally respect that. But once you've established that the animal isn't going to be frightened by you, when they let you touch them, you're, you're making 
you're making a connection. You're making a physical connection with that being. And when I had Clarabelle step onto my hand, I felt the same way as you did holding the rattlesnake, I'm sure. I, I felt like this animal is accepting my palm as a substrate that's safe to walk on. And even though tarantulas don't have terrific eyesight, stepping on your hand, they can taste with their feet. So she was not just touching me, but tasting me also. It's a very intimate thing. Yeah. And I was honored that she let me do that. And everyone thinks like, oh, tarantulas, aren't they all deadly? Well, there's more than 500 species, and there's not one whose venom is toxic enough to no. kill a person. No. At least not a full-grown, healthy person. Right. So I knew that I was in no danger, and, you know, she, the pink toe tarantula is not an, an aggressive tarantula. They typically aren't going to bite you anyway. They're very patient. Um, but to me, you know, this, this showed what I've always felt is that most other thinking, feeling creatures have no interest in hurting us at all. Mm-mm. And that, if anything, we're the ones that need to back off yes. from hurting them, even without our knowing. When, when I was a kid, I, I was astonished when I began to read, learning that just the basic American way of life, which was full of chemicals, which was dependent on petroleum, which involved so many roadways and so so much building and human overpopulation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that without our even realizing it, so many of us were contributing to the extinction of animals who I loved. Yes. So, you know, nobody set out to weaken the eggshells of the bald eagle, but it was an accident that our DDT was causing that to happen. And I'm, I'm sure that nobody set out um, to exterminate whales in modern times. At one time they were hunted, but long after they were hunted, we continued to hurt whales with things as seemingly innocuous as our plastic bags. Yes. Mm-hmm. So we don't even know how much damage that we're doing mm-hmm. unless we get woke Mm-hmm. And that's part of what I want to do in my work, too, is to make us fall in love with the natural world again, so deeply in love that we pay attention and and learn how can we preserve these wonderful creatures. And, and often actually touching them is the way to make that connection. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's part of the reason, or that is the main reason I'm doing this podcast, actually, two reasons. One is um, in between field jobs. It's something that helps me deal with, with, with all this, this ongoing destruction and disregard uh, for the natural world, which I have seen so prevalently throughout my whole life. And um, being able to speak with people about this helps me. And it also helps others hopefully reconnect um, to their wild roots, you know, their natural surroundings, their their creatures in their lives. Um, yeah, absolutely. You mm-hmm. go, girl. This is a wonderful thing that, that you're doing. Thank you. And it's wonderful for your for your listeners. Thank and you. we all help each other. Yeah. You know, and it, 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 sometimes I think, gosh, isn't it horrible to be living right now where, mm-hmm. you know, 2050, there's going to be more plastic in the ocean than fish. And mm-hmm. when climate change is wiping stuff out and mm-hmm. when, you know, all kinds of chemicals are murdering everything and human overpopulation is sweeping like a disease over the world. But then I think, you know what? I was just a little too young to be part of the civil rights movement. Right. And all the people who bravely took part in that changed the world at a critical time. But you and I and your listeners, we all have the opportunity to be part of this great wave to try to essentially save the earth and I what more noble practice could we be involved in than this absolutely <laughs> thank you for that um so going back to the book um 
For me, the chapter about Octavia, the octopus, it was the uh. most striking and moving to me to sense that connection to her, um, yeah. to a creature that's so very different from us. It was, it was quite intense to read, and I felt right alongside you, um, as if I was there when she passed. Learning about Octavia was so very powerful, and besides the moment of her passing uh, and what you've learned from her in her short life, what struck me as especially beautiful was the way that Octavia devoted herself to her unfertilized eggs so tenderly. Could you tell yeah. us about her? Oh, well, you know, Octavia and I, we, we've gotten to be friends at New England Aquarium, um, and for a lot of people, that's like, what? An octopus was your friend? But, yeah, I mean, just the fact that she was a mollusk doesn't mean you can't be friends with a mollusk. And mm -hmm. octopuses are actually extremely smart, recognize individual human faces like some people, dislike others, and this has been proven by a number of scientific experiments. So when she finally, when she laid eggs, it was a bittersweet moment for me. Because once a female octopus lays eggs, whether they're fertile or not, they only do it. They only do it once. They lay like ten thousand eggs, or a hundred thousand eggs. And I mean, it's a lot of eggs. I think it really is more like a hundred thousand eggs. Mm -hmm. Once they finish laying those eggs, they are no longer interested in anything but those eggs. And so the times that we would play together, and I would feed her, and I would stroke her, and she would put her arms and her suckers on my skin and taste and and feel me and we would caress each other and those days were over. She no longer wanted to do anything but sit on those eggs, protect them from any predator, even though there were no predators in her tank, but you never know, you've got to stay mm -hmm. vigilant. Um, clean the eggs, fluff the eggs. She would shoot water out of her siphon to clean the eggs to make sure that no the debris settled on them, and she'd fluff them like like a, a, a person fluffing pillows or, or vacuuming curtains. Mm -hmm. And because in the wild, an, an octopus goes inside of her lair and she lays these eggs and she, she can't leave because if she leaves them, someone else will go in her lair and eat all those eggs. So they don't even eat for the rest of their lives. A female octopus who lays eggs, the last thing she, she does, she lays those eggs, and if she can live long enough, which is usually for a giant Pacific octopus like, like Octavia, only s six more months, they'll live long enough that if they're lucky and if they're fertilized, they'll hatch and she'll use some of her last breaths to blow the power larvae as they hatch out of her den into the open ocean, mm -hmm. and then she dies. It, it just was a powerful thing to read and um, just shows that, that the innate goodness that's in nature. It's there. And it shows us how, how far back evolutionarily mm -hmm. love goes. Yeah. Because, you know, octopuses, octopuses were in the sea long before there was any, anything on land. Yeah, that's and right. They're a very ancient kind of creature. I have always felt that life's first love was eggs. And the first eggs were laid by sea creatures. Oh, that's a very nice image. That's beautiful. Yeah. So this might be an obvious answer, but could you tell us the importance of connecting or rather trying to understand creatures that seem so vastly different from ourselves, such as Octavia was. Yeah, um, what's, what strikes you at first about an octopus is how different they are, right? I mean, their head isn't where our head is. Everybody thinks they know where the octopus's head is, mm -hmm. isn't it? That is actually their, um, their abdomen and their or thorax. We go body, head, limbs. They go head, uh, I'm sorry, we go head, body, limbs, they go body, head, arms, you know, and they have these mm -hmm. eight arms, and where's their mouth? It's in their armpits, and they have three hearts, and their brain is, is in a ring wrapped around the throat, and their arms can regrow if severed, and so on and so forth. They don't have any bones, we're full of them. You would 
think with a creature that different? How could you be friends with someone like that? Mm -hmm. You would think such a thing is impossible. You would think we have nothing in common. And so what shocked me was not so much how different octopuses are from us, but that despite these differences, there are so many similarities that we can play with each other, that we can literally become pets. And I am not anthropomorphizing because scientists have looked at this. Octopus do recognize individual humans, and they prefer some over the others. And octopuses do exhibit play, which is, as, as you know, it's an attribute of higher minds. They like to play with toys. In fact, they like to play with toys so much that aquaria now have enrichment handbooks for octopuses. Octopus doesn't get bored. And they suggest that your octopus play with the same toys that your children play with. They like to play with Mr. Potato Head. They like to play with Legos. You know, they love to put things together and take things apart. Mm -hmm. So that's something you can do with an octopus, and the octopus will enjoy. Now, you know, what does friendship feel like? in the mind of the octopus, and does it feel the same as friendship in the mind of a human? I can't tell you that, because I can't even tell you what friendship feels like in the mind of my husband. Mm -hmm. And if I had a sibling, I couldn't tell you. If, even if, if I had an identical twin, I probably couldn't tell you, because we can't really get inside the minds mm -hmm. of other beings. But we do know that chemically we are very similar and that they share with us all the neurotransmitters that we've ever looked for. And as you know, neurotransmitters are those chemical um, messengers that are responsible for our thoughts and feelings and, and memories. And they have all the same stuff that we do. So it's reasonable to think that things like consciousness, the consciousness has adaptive value for us, why wouldn't it for an octopus? That emotions, happiness and sadness and love, they have adaptive value for us. Well, didn't they evolve for a reason? Why wouldn't they be present in octopuses? So knowing somebody like an octopus, knowing their personality, their individuality, getting to, to feel their how they getting to see how they feel about you, um, and having feelings for them. I think that vastly enlarges our our moral capacity, our capacity to love, yes. our, capa our capacity for joy, our capacity to appreciate and treasure and protect our world. And knowing somebody like Octavia actually looks forward to my visits. And how do I know this? Because when we were apart, sometimes we were apart for weeks at a time. Usually I saw her once a week. But one time I was away from her for several weeks while I was researching another book. And when I came back and I lifted the lid to her tank, she took one look at me. She turned bright red with emotion. She slid over. Her arms came reaching up out of the tank to greet mine. And she hung on to me, essentially hugging me and tasting me for a really long time, much longer than she usually did. And it was just like what happens when you've been away from anyone else that you really care about. You you hug, you embrace, it's, it's you, it's you. I'm so glad to be with you again. That's exactly what happened with us. That must have been so beautiful. Oh, my goodness. And, 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 and it's, then, it's absolutely... you know, at, at the end, as you pointed out, you know, at the very end of her life, um, when, when she was sick and she was dying, she was old, she was tired, she was just weeks away from death. She was, she had been moved away from her eggs, which of course were not viable because they weren't fertilized. And uh, she was behind the scenes. And I went to open her tank to see her one last time. And even though she was exhausted, tired and sick and old, she looked up through that water and saw it was me and chose to rise to the top and greet me with her arms and her suckers and look into my face. And remember, because she'd been tending to her eggs and because she had been in a lair, she had not looked up through the water into my face for, this went on actually for 10 months. Normally in the wild it would be six, but she hung in for 10 months and had not 
sustain me for 10 months. And for an octopus who only lives three years, oh, yeah. 10 months is like not seeing someone for decades. And she remembered me, and she cared enough about me to greet me. Yeah. It was very evident that she... You know, it was not. It was not anthropomizing. It was very evident and very clear that she recognized you. Um, yeah, and she didn't. I I gave her a fish, but she didn't even want the fish. <laughs> She's like, I she just want to see you. The food, she dropped the fish. Yeah, yeah. Oh, um, what is some advice that you can share with us, uh, with our listeners today, on on connecting better to the natural world and to other species? I would say spend more time watching. You know, so few of us make time to just look out the window or go for a hike or sit by a tree. Um, this time of year, um, many, many people are noticing birds, nests, for example. But one of the, of the problems that bird rehabilitators have is that people bring in nestlings who haven't been abandoned. Mm-hmm. The problem is, people have trouble sitting and watching the nest for like 40 minutes to make sure that the female <laughs> isn't coming back to feed them. This is a big problem with hummingbirds who may return and leave the nest 150 times a day. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times rehabbers get these perfectly fine babies rescued when the people who have a good heart, but they just could not sit still and watch that nest for 40 minutes to make sure that the female wasn't coming back. So I would say make time for yourself to just watch the natural world and see what happens. Watch a spider. Watch a bird feeder. You know, um, watch a nest. Sit by a tree and see who comes, and it'll be a real treat for you, and you'll notice that your blood pressure will drop, and you'll feel happier. Yeah, thank you. I have a standard question that I normally ask all of my guests, and it is it is something you've pretty much already covered, which is, um, I'm going I'm to share it with you anyway, because maybe you have something, um, but it is, could you sh- share a special connection or an experience you have made in nature or with an animal, whether recent or as a child? And I love this question because I never know what I'm going to get, and I get such beautiful responses, unexpected responses. And that's the essence of Wild Roots, you know, is to get people to think about those moments. Um, yeah. Yeah, I bet you get some fabulous responses. Fabulous, yeah. So I think well, you... Well, I can, I can tell you a surprising one that yeah. I haven't discussed yet. And this was something that a wild ermine showed me. And it was on Christmas Day. We, we have hens, and on Christmas Day, I always make them a, a big bowl of hot popcorn. And I carried this down to my girls, who I've raised from little tiny chicks, and I know each one individually, and they know me, and they perch on my shoulders, and um, they're very, very dear to me. Well, one of my hens was dead on the floor. So I went to pick her up, and I couldn't. Her head was wedged in the corner. And the reason I couldn't pick her up was somebody had a hold of her head. And when I pulled and I pulled and I pulled, out from the corner of the coop, from a little tiny hole, popped this absolutely pure white head with cold black eyes and a little pink nose and blood around the mouth. And it was an ermine. It was a white-coated winter form of a weasel. And this weasel had killed somebody that I loved. And you would think that I would be so angry at that weasel for killing somebody I loved, a dear sweet hen who had perched on me and would talk to me in her lilting chicken voice, who would come when I call, (laughs) who would let me pet her. And yet, I looked at the perfection of that weasel. I looked at the strength of that tiny animal who weighed as much as a handful of coins, and it was staring me down, me who weighs 120 pounds, fearlessly looking into my face, saying, give me back my chicken. (laughs) And at that moment, I knew what forgiveness feels like, because Mm -hmm. that weasel reminded me of my mother who I had lost earlier that year, 
There was a lot of baggage between me and my mother. But I saw that even though my mother, like everyone we love, had done some things to hurt me, has had that weasel, there was also beauty and a, a kind of perfection to both of them. And so on Christmas Day, I received the gift of learning forgiveness from a wild hermit. Thank you so much for sharing that. So what is in store for Cy Montgomery? I've learned that you just got back from Ecuador. Could you tell us about that trip and what else you might be working on? Well, this was this was funny. I was um, I was going to work on a book on giant manta rays, um, but there was a, a problem with the researcher that we were focusing on, and at the last minute we were forced to cancel it. Um, she was actually uh, not in Ecuador, but we were going to Ecuador anyway because that was a place that you could ostensibly see giant manta rays, and um, we went there, and uh, the photographer and his wife and I, and we had the most fabulous diving experience, but we didn't see any manta rays. Mm. But, but you know, the, the world has so much to show you. Yeah. And we didn't, we didn't feel disappointed. We didn't feel cheated. We came back feeling elated. And I think that's one of the great things that that trip showed me. And among other things, I had a wonderful encounter with my friends, with a wild octopus down there, oh, which was really great. Wow. And the next, um, my next thing that immediately I'm doing is um, working on the promotion of my new book, The Magnificent Migration, that comes out July 1. Mm-hmm. And meanwhile, I've got another book in the pipeline on the, um, the rescue from the brink of extinction of the California condor. And I'm working on a book um, for kids based on uh, how to be a good creature for little, little kids with art from the same fantastic artist who did the art for Mm -hmm. good creature for adults. So um, life is full of great things. And I'm going to take my vitamins and hope I stay on this planet a long time. You will. Well, it's great to be on the planet with you yes. and your listeners. Thank you for letting me be on the show. Yes, thank you. I had such a blast talking with Sai. She is truly a human being whom I can feel a kinship. Thank you again, Sai. Sai's advice to connecting better to the creatures within the natural world and to nature itself requires just one simple thing to pay attention. Pay attention and sit with nature and you'll discover superpowers beyond your imagination and perhaps many more lessons on how to be a good creature. This is Wild Roots. Thanks for listening.